Tilawi. In the first hour, ladies and gentlemen, we spoke with uh, David Duke regarding the uh, Holocaust um, conference that was held in uh, Iran. And uh, of course, you know, as you, uh, th this was a good example and a good uh, case uh, study here of how the media manipulates things. And uh, the reason I asked David and I mentioned to him that the conference did not get any coverage in the United States. Of course, it got a lot of coverage, and I made it clear to David that David Duke got a lot of coverage, not the conference, not what went on in the conference, not the substance of the conference, and not who had attended the conference, because definitely David Duke was more of a speaker than a researcher in this, because what you had to do to uh, basically go into uh, this conference, you had to have written a paper, a research paper, a scientific paper, and most of those, uh, most people who went there, they went there either to say it didn't happen the way you're saying it happened, or it happened the way the media is saying it happened. So both views were present there. You had Dr. Tobin from Australia, he was there with uh, his uh, basically the uh, a model of the Ashworth building uh, uh, prison and uh, he has a uh, few things to, uh, to prove and definitely um, I don't know I did not see it I did not hear about uh, uh, exactly what happened but I've seen that in Washington at one time I've seen his presentation and uh, definitely it holds a lot of water and uh, also there were a lot more um, researchers and uh, scholars there who uh, presented both sides. There were scholars there who said and presented proofs that six million Jews have died. Uh, definitely, definitely uh, something happened uh, in what we call the Holocaust. I don't believe it was just a Holocaust against Jews. I think it was a Holocaust against a lot of people and Jews included. Uh, and uh, do I believe uh, uh, Jews were systematically uh, uh, picked on and eliminated? I don't know. Because I'm not able to see a professional independent study on the Holocaust. And basically, you know, some people say, no, 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 you should not be talking about the Holocaust. You don't talk about the Holocaust. It's a taboo subject. I think Iran was basically trying to prove a point with uh, doing this, uh, basically uh, when the Western media looked at the uh, cartoons that were published in Denmark about uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, the Western media and Western government uh, basically uh, said, hey look, what's the big deal, it's freedom of speech. Well, Iran said, okay, we're going to see how far you're gonna, we, uh, um, you believe in this freedom of speech thing. And apparently the world does not believe in freedom of speech because Iran was condemned for having this conference uh, about the Holocaust. To me personally, why not? Why not? As a Palestinian, I do have an interest in knowing exactly what happened, if it's true or if it was a lie, because after all, the world had decided that it was okay for the Jews of Europe to go and steal the land of Palestine and to kill the Palestinians and to force them off of their land as refugees whom 
some of them are still uh, uh, like three and fourth generations of refugees there are more Palestinian refugees than there are Palestinians living in Palestine so I do have a personal interest in knowing not just the journalistic interest that let's see what happened but actually I want to know why did the world decided to give uh, not to give but to say okay Jews of Europe you can go and take Palestine you know two things either they did not want them in their own in their countries the United States and Europe did not want the Jews who were coming out of Europe uh, coming out of these concentration camps to go into these countries in their own countries in the, the United States and stuff so they said okay let's give them to uh, 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 let's give them Palestine and the people in the world when they found out what happened with the Jews that six million of them died they decided to that hey it's okay the Jews need a home and of course they did not know much about the Palestinians at that time but you know the idea of the Jews going to Palestine did not start in World War two as you know uh, some of you know, I don't know, after the uh, um, uh, Obama, Barack Obama story that I told in the first hour, I don't know how much people really know out there or they even know what the heck we're talking about. Probably a lot of them don't know and that's the tragedy in our people here in the United States that they are not informed of world events. World events that actually end up affecting our own lives and one of them is the, the war in Iraq. It's affecting our lives directly, and most people still don't know uh, what in the world is, uh, is going on. Tell you what, I'm going to go, uh, before we introduce our uh, uh, guest in the second hour, let's go to the phones and speak with Jack. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, yes, Jack. good evening, Dr. Salawi. Good evening. Yes, uh, well, Dr. Salawi, I have a quick comment and a question. While I, you know, I've been following your show and I agree with you on it, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the principles of the Bush administration, the, the conservative, and even the Zionist. Zionist forces is out there in the world who are trying to control this world based on their agenda uh, and some in the Jewish community. But the problem I have, w whether or not to believe a person like David Duke, is that uh, I'm looking at uh, this old adage, your enemy is my enemy, only because uh, Duke is, uh, is a, uh, feels that the Jewish people are his enemy, that he's somewhat uh, uh, in agreement with uh, the people in Iran uh, or the people who are forming the conference. So I, I have a skepticism about that, Dr. Talawi. In, in the same sense, when Mr. Green called in and talked about Mr. Duke's past with the Klan, you know, Mr. Duke, you, just like you said, you could research the Internet, you could uh, find the links and find the stories. Mr. Duke is still associated with those groups that want to kill black, I'm an African American, want to kill black people, want to get them off the face of the earth. So I have a problem with Mr. Duke being the messenger of that, that whole notion of, of the, the situation uh, that was discussed. So I, 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 I would like in the future that you would let uh, or you would uh, have a broader discussion on Mr. Duke, uh, his, his, him being more genuine uh, about this whole notion of, uh, of caring about the people in the Middle East. Because, you know, in the past, I, too, as an African-American, have studied my history, and I know the Jewish people have had a hand in, in the African Holocaust with, with the uh, slavery trade and even people of Muslim descent. And, and I, have, I don't have no problem with that. But uh, let it be known, I know Mr. Duke is still a, a person who, who feels that black people are his enemy on this earth. So that's my comment. I just want to uh, see if you uh, could uh, comment on the fact that he's genuine about what he believes in, in the sense that it, as it relates to Iran, or he's just doing this because uh, his, en uh, his enemy, the Jews, is, is the same enemy of the uh, Iraqis. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, uh, Jack uh, raises up some important issues here. And, uh, you know, we really don't know what's in the heart of a man. Only the one who created him knows what's in his heart. You take people at face value and unless they prove otherwise. And I really think, you know, I've, I've had David here more than one time uh, on the show. I had him in the studio uh, at one time for uh, probably about an hour and a half, actually. David says he does not hate black people. He does not hate any other race, but he is working for his own race, which is the white people. Now, do I disagree with him on that? Not at all. If he wants to work for the, uh, for the white people, for his own race, that is fine. He has every right to do it. 
Now, as far as, you know, he hates blacks, he said he doesn't. And more than one time he said he does not, but he wants people to basically um, live with their own. Okay? And um, now, as far as uh, what he thinks about, you know, the Jews and the Palestinians and all this stuff, well, it happened, and you're right, it happened that the enemy of the Palestinians are the Zionists, and the enemies of uh, David Duke are the Zionists too, the Jewish supremacists. Now, do I agree with him on the Jewish supremacist thing? I think he has a lot of valid points, and I agree with David Duke on some of the issues. I disagree with him on other issues. But I really wish if David Duke can somehow uh, wave a magic stick and get rid of this racist impression that is out there about him. And to tell you the truth, I have gotten in a lot of trouble and a lot of people have basically disowned me for having David Duke on. Now, am I sorry that I had David Duke on? No. David is welcome to come on this show anytime he wants. If I agree with him or not, I have disagreed with people that I brought back on the show. David has a reputation and apparently anyone that comes close to him will get burnt, but you have to stand up for something. You have to stand up for something, and I really think that David Duke has been smeared in the media because of what he says about the Jewish supremacists. I really believe that. Because look what happened. You know, with the Marshammer Walt paper, the media wanted to interview David Duke so David Duke's opinion can match up with uh, Marshammer and Walt's opinion on the Israel lobby, just to say basically that you see, these people, these two scholars, one from the University of Chicago, another one from Harvard, the dean of the uh, School of Government in Harvard, Stephen Walt, they discredit them because, oh, this is the opinion of David Duke. Well, no, it just happened to be the opinion of David Duke amongst other scholars and amongst other people. It was not just David Duke who thought that their paper was right on target. And now the, uh, the media have only uh, interviewed David Duke for this uh, Iran conference to basically discredit the Iran conference that David Duke was in there. They did not go and interview other people. They did not see what happened there. They did not want, they care less about what happened. They just wanted to get David Duke on the screen to associate the conference with David Duke and smear him with his uh, KKK past. And that's basically it. So that's how the media works. And I think they succeeded because we don't see debates or anything on the issue uh, when it comes to uh, uh, to, to the point of the uh, the conference, etc., etc., and I think what Iran was basically is wanting to prove a point that if you think freedom of speech with, with these cartoons, then uh, take freedom of speech when we discuss the uh, the Holocaust. And I think that's that's the whole thing. Uh, what it was, I believe, uh, Jeffrey is with us. Uh, Jeffrey, can you hear me? I am here. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. I'm, I'm happy to be here again. It's been a while. Yes, it has been a while. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Blankford is a radio program producer. Uh, he's a journalist and a Jewish American and has been a pro-Palestinian human rights activist since 1970. He was formerly the editor of the Middle East Labor Bulletin and co-founder of the Labor Committee of the Middle East. He was also a founding member of the November 29th Coalition on Palestine. He won a uh, sizable lawsuit against the Anti-Defamation League of uh, Bene Barat. Uh Jeffrey, we have a lot to talk about. And uh, let me just get your opinion. The subject in the first hour uh, was the Iran conference. Uh, let me just get, a, get your opinion about the, uh, the conference. Uh, in, in a word, uh, it was unwise. Uh, not that, uh, I mean, I have been one who has watched over the years how the, the Holocaust official narrative has been used 
to justify not only every crime by Israel uh, on the planet, but also to silence any kind of criticism of, of Jews or Israel in the United States. But that being said, that is, at this point in time, the design is strong point. Uh, it's the one thing that I, and people I know who are totally pro-Palestinian, totally anti-Zionist, not Jewish, and with no, and, and absolutely with, do not want to see the existence of the state of Israel. When you bring up the issue of the Holocaust, they go into a shell because they have been conditioned and grown up with the official narrative. And to challenge that is to challenge the, the lobby strength. And I think that politically it was a mistake, particularly given the efforts being made by the lobby in the United States, I think by the Jewish lobby, to foment an attack on Iran by either the United States or to get the support of an attack by Israel on Iran. And that's why I think it was politically a mistake. Um, I think the... The revisionists have, have opened a number of a avenues in, uh, let's say, Holocaust studies. Uh, but, and you see how defensive uh, the other side is in terms of, of uh, putting people in jail uh, for just words or just doubting the official narrative. This is what, this has become like a religion. The official narrative is a religion. It's like some ancient religion in which if you're, you're a heretic, if you don't subscribe to it, and you're put to, not on the fire, but you're put in prison. And this is what the Holocaust narrative has become. Unfortunately, uh, we're not in a situation where it can be discussed historically like any other historical event. And I don't, I, I frankly don't think at this point in time it's productive to push this issue when thousands of people are dying in Iraq, a whole country has been destroyed by the United States in a war that I believe was waged for Israel's benefit, uh, whether it, it, it was in fact, uh, I think that was the motive, and when the Palestinians are being squeezed and sanctioned uh, by Israel uh, with the support of the United States and Western Europe. And these are the issues that a conference like this diverts attention from. Okay. Um, uh, Jeff, I had Noam Chomsky on the program, and I know you have written about Noam Chomsky, yeah. and I'm going to tell you what he said on this program just uh, a few months ago when I asked him about 9-11. Uh, he said, uh, yeah, the government story, two planes hit the buildings, and uh, the buildings uh, fell. Now... I know you have your own opinion of Noam Chomsky. Now, I did not buy that. And uh, another thing, I have, uh, I asked him, I said, you have practically millions of followers and fans around the world. Why aren't you taking an active step towards helping the Palestinians? Because, you know, he's, he's talking about how badly the, the Palestinians have been oppressed by the Israelis, but he's in a position to take active steps, and he is not taking those active steps. And some of these active steps uh, is like, you know, calling for a boycott of Israeli products or, or divestments, etc., etc. With, with the followings that he has, I think he could be effective if he really wants to help the Palestinians. Uh, tell me uh, what you think about uh, Chomsky with those two points. Uh, it's difficult to 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 encapsulize Chomsky, but I think he has done overall a massive disservice for the Palestinian struggle. What he has done initially is to educate people about the issue, and then, like a pied piper, lead them away from the truth. The truth is that the, the Jewish lobby, Israel lobby, the Zionist lobby, this is before any Christians were involved, has been controlling U.S. policy in the Middle East for the last four decades. And essentially, as Stephen Green, who researched a book from the State Department's relation with Israel, said, uh, what, what essentially has happened is that the law, Israel and his friends in America have determined the, the parameters in which an American president can function in the Middle East. And, and, and within those parameters, they make policy. And... Uh, Chomsky, in his, all his writings, and I've written that he's like a human tsunami, he turns out a book a year, 
He's written the same thing over and over and over again, but in all those uh, publications, he managed to exclude three major confrontations between U.S. presidents and the Israel lobby in Israel, between Gerald Ford, between uh, Jimmy Carter, and George Bush Sr., uh, because he wants us to believe, and he actually writes, that all these presidents were strong supporters of Israel, when the facts are totally in the opposite of that. And uh, so I, I see Chomsky as the gatekeeper, a, a real uh, protector of the Israel lobby. And I see, unfortunately, uh, most of what we call the left in this country, which is kind of a joke, uh, swallows Chomsky. They quote him without even citing him, like like he's some kind of an oracle they have imbibed, and they they quote his statements uh, without even using him as a reference. That's how that's how serious the issue is. Today we have sanctions against the Palestinians. There should be sanctions against the Israelis, and Chomsky should be against sanctions. And the reason he gives is amazing because the Israeli public. It's against sanctions, as if the Israeli public should be the determining factor when they are that when the Israeli public in a democracy for Jews is has supported the oppression of the Palestinians and well, the possession of them. You know what, Jeffrey? Uh, if they if they ask for sanctions on Iran because of the uh, uh, of the uh, the nuclear uh, weapon thing that they have nuclear energy then I guess we have to ask the Iranian people to see if they agree with those sanctions or not. Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. It, that, that is really, a, 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 it, it's silly to even uh, uh, think about. And regarding 9-11, uh, Chomsky has been the major gatekeeper. Now, there are a lot of different theories about 9-11, but anyone who's done any kind of examination has come to the conclusion there was much more to it than the official government narrative. And in fact, it, it, there, there is evidence that Israelis of Mossad knew about this in advance because five Mossad agents, which were identified by name in the Jewish Forward newspaper on March 15, 2002, uh, were across the river ready to film and were actually filming, uh, making a video of the towers collapsing while evidently celebrating and, do, and doing high fives. And so a woman saw them and called the police. And they were arrested and they were kept in New Jersey prison for two and a half months before being sent back to Israel. And they were one of them, they were members of working for a phony moving company, which was the Mossad Front. Now, uh, they, how did they know to be across the river, ready with a video camera? Right. What were they doing here in, in the United States in the first place? Okay. Now, uh, speaking of that, I, I know you have commented on a on a, on a report. Uh, I don't know how true this report is, which is uh, uh, prior knowledge of 9/11 attacks overheard in Hebrew. That was the title of the uh, uh, of this particular article that said that a an ex former Mossad agent heard uh, Jews speaking at a cemetery in New Jersey. Uh, this was like 11 months before, it was like in October uh, of, uh, not, yeah, in October of 2000, uh, basically saying, uh, we will see how the United States is going to react when those planes hit the buildings. I know you commented on that. Do you think that report was true report? Uh, I can't say. I think it could be, and that's why I put it out to my mailing list. Now, people say, well, they wouldn't talk like this. The truth of the matter is uh, some of these folks are so supremacist, Jewish supremacists, they, that they, they have gotten away literally with murder, and they like to brag about it. Now, it's interesting that several years ago, uh, a, a Jewish former member of APAC, called the president of APAC and acted as if he was going to give him a number, quite a bit of money. And this former president, the president of APAC, he's now a former president, but he's president at the time, started talking about all the things that, that, that they were going to get the Bill Clinton administration to do, namely okay. APAC. And if you listen to this conversation, you would say it was made up. But the man who was, who was on the other end recorded the conversation. And, and put it out and published it. It didn't get the, the wide circulation it should have got for the obvious reason it had to do with APAC. Uh, but the president had to resign of APAC. But there was no 
question that this was a legitimate conversation. Now, this conversation was very much the same kind of conversation that was overheard in the cemetery. That's all I can say. I can't say whether it was real or yeah. not. Well, uh, uh, Jeffrey, uh, a former intelligence showed, agent. Pardon? We showed, uh, while you are talking about the, uh, the cemetery issue, we showed the business cards of the uh, two FBI people who went and actually spoke with this guy, and also uh, uh, the letter that's, uh, uh, that they sent him, because he did ask for protection from the FBI, and the FBI sent him a letter saying we can't give you uh, protection, so he did not give them the story. But I mean, the story in a nutshell well, for our viewers yeah. who have not heard this one, uh, that the Israelis knew and actually planned uh, the uh, the attack of September 11th, and this Mossad agent had that information to tell the FBI, and the FBI w would not give him full protection, so he did not tell them. You know, uh, th th this is what the story was. Um, I my own theory before reading this was that uh, Mossad had penetrated, and perhaps elements of the U.S. intelligence services not the CIA, had penetrated the uh, the hijacking group because, in fact, 9-11 uh, the, the put Al-Qaeda on the map. And it's, it's just like people in other parts of the world have their political agendas. Uh, a lot of people like to look at the situation in, in Afghanistan where the Mujahideen defeated the Soviet Union with the help of the United States. Well, they weren't working as American puppets. They wanted to get rid of communism or the communist, pro-communist government, pro-Soviet government in Afghanistan. The Mujahideen did. So uh, it was a mutual benefit situation. And even though there were there were antagonisms between obviously the United States and the Mujahideen and later Al Qaeda and the United States. At certain situations, they may have desired to do a similar event, even though for different reasons. Uh, for example, the 9/11 event was welcomed by many people around the world, including in China, because they say, "Here's the United States, the big." the powerful United States, which has been delivering death to people all over the world for decades, being hit by uh, a terrorist act where the United States has been inflicting terrorism on people around the world. Now, I don't support that position, but I, I see how that position could be uh, supported by people who have been victims of American uh, policies around the world. And so in this situation, Al-Qaeda became on the map, so to speak, uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, speaking of Al-Qaeda, Jeff, uh, it seems like every time George Bush needs help, Al-Qaeda is there ready to help. Uh, he's asking, he asked for $100 billion a couple of days ago, and today he's saying he wants to increase the, uh, uh, the, the number of uh, troops that we have in Iraq. And then all of a sudden, uh, Abdul Wahri, who's supposedly the second man, uh, to me, I think he's probably the first man, because uh, I don't think uh, Osama bin Laden is still alive. But uh, how come Al-Qaeda is always there with the statements ready whenever George Bush wants them to be? Well, it, it, seems, that, it seems that way, but actually, uh, Bush is making statements all the time. Uh, on the uh, and, and and there's no statements from Al Qaeda, um, and Al Qaeda, of course, is a, at best is an amorphous organization which doesn't have a, a singular head anymore. I mean, there are people in this country who say it doesn't exist, but but there are other people who had contacts with it. So, although uh, Nafiz Mossadegh Ahmed, uh, a British researcher, uh, has written a book in which he has Zahiri. Uh, uh, running around England and running around the Middle East where he could have been picked up by U.S. and British intelligence and wasn't. So, in a sense, he may be doing his thing, but it also turns out to be useful for the United States and for Israel. So Al-Qaeda is, Al is good for America and Israel? Uh, it, 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 it works for them in the short run. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a much more, co it's a very complicated situation in which, uh, it, it's, let's say it, it's kind of out of control. And, and, it, and I, I don't usually like to speculate on it because there's so many unknowns. Uh, 
Uh, and I, I prefer to deal with things that I could actually substantiate. That's why I deal mostly with American domestic politics and, and the influence of the lobby okay. and control on, on Washington and the media and on, very, on virtually every aspect of American body politics and culture. Okay, well, let, let's go to uh, domestic politics. Um, Jimmy Carter has written a book I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Palestine... Um, peace or apartheid, and he's been attacked viciously as an anti-Semite and etc., etc. What do you think about that deal? Well, first of all, American Jews, by and large, do not like Jimmy Carter. In, in 1980, they gave him 48% of the vote, the lowest vote for any Democrat in modern times. Uh, what most people don't realize is that Israel and the lobby were not happy with Camp David. They did not want to give up the Sinai. Uh, when Israel captured land, it, did, it intended to keep that land, and only Jimmy Carter, using the, the, the power of the American presidency, forced Camp David onto Israel. Now, before Camp David was dry, Israel invaded Lebanon in 1978. Uh, what I believe Begin was hoping for was that Egypt would do something which would cause Israel to break the negotiations off. But rather, Sadat rolled over on his belly and Egypt's been on his back for Israel and the U.S. ever since. But three months into that invasion in 1978, it's been largely forgotten, Jimmy Carter ordered Israel to, and Begin to withdraw the troops back to Israel. So here you have Israel forced to give up land. They were going to get money anyway from the United States. That was, you know, people talked about all the money through Camp David. Israel was already getting more money and more money. Israel was going to get money, Camp David or no, or no Camp David. But they did not like Camp David. And then Carter really wanted a solution to the Palestinian situation. And he proposed an international conference, a Geneva conference, inviting the Soviet Union. Well, the Jews went crazy. They went crazy. Israel went crazy, and Carter had to back off. Then, the last time a U.S. Uh, diplomat, a U.S. ambassador to the U.N. veto, or excuse me, voted for a resolution condemning Israel was under Carter's presidency when he, his ambassador, Donald McHenry, uh, voted to sanction Israel or voted in a resolution uh, that was criticizing Israel in the U.N. And, of course, it was hullabaloo in the United States, and it was, it was, it was claimed to be a mistake, and it was apologies all around. He, the man had to resign, Donald McHenry. Uh, most people don't know this, so Carter comes into this situation really, really hated by, uh, I would say, the, certainly the Jewish lobby and Israel. And so now here is Carter calling doing two things, calling what Israel's doing in the, in the West Bank and Gaza apartheid. When, when Chomsky won't do this, uh, and talking about the power of the, of the Jewish lobby at AIPAC and their control of the media. And so, so what you've seen is every major Jewish organization viciously attack Carter in a way nobody, nobody has ever been attacked by them before. Uh, Chomsky, they, they love Chomsky, actually. They couldn't have picked a better spokesperson than the other side of Chomsky. Uh, Mearsheimer and Walt Jeff, actually Jeff. broke the... Pardon? Jeff, yeah. what are we going to do with this APAC thing? I mean, it, it can't continue going and controlling the country like this. What can be done about it? Uh, to, to, to me, my idea is for uh, people... Instead of talking about slogans about end the occupation and right of return, which are legitimate, of course, but, but have no residence in the American public, people have to go in their own communities and make uh, uh, an effort, an educational effort, to tell people, explain to people how the lobby has controlled uh, their politics and their, their American politics and, and it's on the internet you can see it on the, the Mother Jones 400 for example the, the 2000 election 2004 election 2000 election uh, the top donors 
to the both political parties. Uh, the first 250, uh, 7 out of 10 were Jewish, 12 out of 20 were Jewish, 125 out of the first 250 were Jewish. That's, that, that's an extraordinary uh, demonstration of political clout, because money in America is, is the, the milk of American politics. And in the Chronicle yesterday, it mentions that Walter Shorenstein, the leading Democrat and a former member of a board member of APAC, has given uh, over two million dollars to the Democratic Party in the last two years, the last year. Now, people talk about political action committees. Uh, these are are not nearly as important as they used to be. It's individual givers who give money to the political parties, and the political parties then give money to the politicians. So you have, in fact, APAC is the, is the controlling owner of the Democratic Party. And the evidence is manifest. When Howard Dean was running for president, he was getting money on the Internet. And this scared the Democratic Party. And people who were supporting Dean then said to him, uh, Howard, you have a great position on Iraq, but you have the APAC position on Israel and Palestine. You have to change. So he made the statement, we need to be even-handed. And what happened? They jumped all over him, starting with Joe Lieberman, John Kerry, and Nancy Pelosi. And then, unfortunately, Dean started backtracking and apologizing, and now he's a hitman for the lobby. Right. Now, you know, I, I asked you what can be done, and you gave me the answer, which is an eloquent answer. But, uh, Jeffrey, we live in a country that probably one half of one percent know exactly what goes on. In the first hour, I told my viewers a story about uh, Barack Obama. I said a radio station in Chicago had uh, asked their audience, well, uh, I don't want to say Chicago, I want to say Chicago at the end, but they had asked the audience, do you think Barack Obama is a dangerous terrorist? And most callers said yes, and the United States military should track him down and kill him. The second question was... Wait, Barack Obama? Well, well hold on, hold on. Yes. Uh, the second question was, uh, what country is Barack Obama the president of? And they named Algeria, e Egypt, uh, <laughs> t t Sudan, uh, Tunisia. And the, 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 this radio station and the callers were from Chicago, where Barack Obama is from. So, Jeffrey, we're talking about, we have a horrible situation here where our own people are not seeing the fire in the house. Well, I, I'll tell you uh, something that can be done. Uh, some small things. Um, this is an example of something I did uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, when they had a dedication in San Francisco for a plaque for... Uh, the soldiers from San Francisco who died in Vietnam. And they had a ceremony with a color guard. And I made a one-page flyer about the USS Liberty, describing that, that battle and that, that attack by Israel in 1967. And I passed it out to everybody there, and I held it up in front of the Marine color guard so they could read it while they were holding the, the colors in their rifles. The flyer was welcomed by everybody. And they couldn't believe the story because they hadn't heard it before. Unfortunately, uh, people who support the Palestinian struggle have stayed away from the USS Liberty story for reasons I can only speculate. I didn't want to speculate. But in fact, uh, the Liberty story, the attack, uh, the Levant affair, the attack on the U.S. cultural and British cultural libraries in the, in the 50s in, in Egypt, and they tried to blame it on the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, this is the kind of thing Americans, when I talk to people about this, they are enraged. And here's another thing. Are you, are you aware that Israel, that the United States Congress voted on its last day to virtually reimburse Israel for the war in Lebanon? Oh, I didn't know that. This is extraordinary. This is the first time on the media. Uh, uh, why? Did we, did we tell them to go do it? I mean, is that why? No, no. Uh, but the Congress is in such thrall to the lobby that on the very last day of Congress, uh, Congress, rather than voting uh, an appropriate uh, appropriation, which would have been embarrassing, they decided to uh, uh, extend 
two billion uh, loan guarantees to Israel, uh, four and a half billion dollars of loan guarantees to, to year 211. But one other thing is really important. The United States keeps military stores, military weapons stored in Israel ostensibly for the use by the United States in Iraq or some other place. In fact, this is not for the U.S. at all. And Israel used most of these weapons in the war in Lebanon, and Congress has voted not only to replace these weapons, but to double the amount of the weapons. But, but so, in know, fact, I mean, the U.S. What happens, what happens in this case, Jeffrey, the whole world, you know, speculation at that time was Israel is doing a... Uh, 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 the United States was fighting a proxy war uh, by using Israel, and, and, and when we do this, it's going to basically prove uh, other people's point. Well, the fact is, Israel has never, in any case since it became a state, no Israeli soldier has ever shed a drop of blood for American cause, and actually Ariel Sharon was quoted on the Israeli radio as saying that, that Washington knows that American, Israel is not going to fight America's wars, uh, and Washington knows that. But, and, but you, know, you know for sure, and you, and you wrote about this, that actually American blood was spilled uh, for Israel's interest, especially in Iraq, right? Uh, American blood was spilled a, a number of times for for uh, Israel's interest. It was spilled in 1983 when the Marine barracks were blown up. There, it, because the U.S., because the Democrats and Republicans both supported sending the Marines there, but if it had not been for Israel uh, attacking Lebanon and killing 17,000 people in a war that has been largely put under the rug by the American media. If that had not happened, the Marines wouldn't have been there in the first place. Okay. Um, and now we have the, 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 the power of the Jewish lobby in Europe as well, which is now much stronger than it ever was before. We have NATO stationed in southern Lebanon, in, in a sense, working for Israel. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I have to ask you a professional question. Yes. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the conference in Iran... And the way it was covered here in the States, uh, my question to you is, if David Duke was not present at that conference, do you, would you think there would be any interest in even mentioning the conference? Yes, they would have mentioned it without him. Okay. Uh, they, they had given they, it? They, they, David, David Duke uh, was window dressing or, or the icing on the cake. They would have mentioned it without him because the whole idea is to portray Amadina John as another Hitler. And the point, that, of course, that he made that whatever happened in, in Europe, nobody in the Middle East was responsible for it, and the Palestinians certainly weren't, shouldn't have had to pay for it. That point was a good point. But to hold a conference at this critical time uh, with, the, with the media is so controlled and dominated by the lobby that they are looking for every way to demonize Iran, and this is why the conference was unwise. Okay. So you think uh, they did not go after Ahmadinejad, uh, kind of David Duke took the, uh, the brunt of the whole uh, attack then? No, it, David Duke's an easy target. That's why when Mearsheimer and Wall's paper came out, David Duke, they always raised, bring David Duke out there. Uh, as a matter of fact, when it comes to the talking about Israel and Palestine, David Duke, Pat Buchanan, there are a number of people on the so-called right that are much more um, informative about the situation in Israel and Palestine than Noam Chomsky or a number of the pundits on the left. But the point is, is in this kind of situation, it was politically, strategically a mistake in my position. I, I, I have been advocating or arguing that there will not be an attack on Iran because an attack on Iran by either the United States or Israel will cause Iraq to explode against American soldiers in a way it hasn't at this point. Um, that uh, the but both that, that all the groups of the Shia in in Iran will turn their weapons on the U.S. 
it, it might be a brief moment where Shia and Sunni together are fighting the U.S. in in Iraq. Uh, exactly. But, that was, that's exactly my point. But it would but but it would be a total disaster. Now, this is why I believe the United States wouldn't do it. Also, if Iran was successful in closing the Straits of Hormuz, uh, European economy would come to a standstill. The price of oil would would skyrocket. Um, it would be a major disaster, and yet this is what the lobby is continuing to push. As a matter of fact, this uh, the Baker Hamilton report. Uh, that panel is part of this whole question because the two things that they really um, and, and the, uh, the neocons in the lobby have been attacking the Baker Hamilton report. They hate Baker because Baker was openly critical of Israel uh, all the time during the, the first Bush administration. But there are two things they don't like it. And one, the connection that that Baker and the and the, and the panel make with the Israel Palestinian situation, to, uh, connecting it to Iraq. Uh, and the fact that uh, they, they authorize or advocate speaking with Iran and Syria. Now, the neocons are totally against any kind of diplomacy. They want to continue uh, the war that they started in Iraq with Iran, and uh, the fact that people like Chomsky and people on the left have let them get away with it. The anti-war movement never talks about the neocons. Uh, the, the, the Democrats won't talk about them either, so it's, the only people who are really talking about them are people on the right. Okay. Uh, it's ironic. <laughs> We're telling the truth about uh, what's going on in Iraq. So, uh, I mean, comes from the right. But but I mean, don't you think if if the uh, the purpose of going and attacking Iraq was uh, for Israel, um, don't you think the job is accomplished and now they need to find a way to uh, get the troops back? Well, one thing that they wanted, one of the reasons having the U.S. in Iraq was with the U.S. bogged down occupying an Arab country, the U.S. would be less likely to position to criticize Israel for its tactics in occupying Palestine. In fact, we saw how the Israelis gave a number of tips to the American soldiers on how to occupy an, an Arab village. And we saw uh, some of the very same things happening uh, in Iraq that we have seen in the West Bank and Gaza, where they clear whole areas for fields of fire. And what happens at checkpoints in Iraq was happening the same thing we've had checkpoints in, in Palestine. So I think that Israel likes the idea of the U.S. being bogged down in Iraq because in that position, they're less likely to lecture Israel on how they should be treating the Palestinians. Uh, what did um, Dick Cheney want when he um, went to Saudi Arabia and the next day uh, Bush went to Jordan? What's, uh, are they cooking something new? I think... Um, they're they're trying to kind of do damage control and want to see how much of a threat the um, the Saudis and Jordanians see uh, the Shia being in power in Iraq and, and and what that connection would mean to Iran. So basically, because, they're, they're trying to create an environment where Israel's security concerns are those of the Arab Sunnis' security controls, so they will have this Israeli is, yes, camp. They're, they're, they're supposedly, there have been some meetings between the Saudi officials and Israeli officials, and that very well could have happened, because... Now, of course, uh, now, now Jeffrey, uh, of course, yeah. nothing could happen unless Israel takes care of the Palestinian problem. Do you think the Palestinian card, uh, which everybody seems to be playing it uh, uh, at this time, I mean, Iran's playing it, Everybody's playing the Palestinian card. Do you think now it's the wild card? You know, I've seen it played and played and played. We have a situation where uh, Abbas is, is so openly a collaborator with the United States um, that uh, I, I think the Israelis would like to see a civil war between the Palestinians. Uh, I don't, I don't see any breakthrough at this point, a anything happening on that front uh, that, that's going to be that's going to be a meaningful change, except perhaps getting worse. We saw, uh, for example, when everyone was talking about Lebanon, and correctly so, and the UN and, uh, was talking about sending 
troops that ended up being essentially NATO troops into southern Lebanon, Israel was continuing its attacks on people in Gaza as if it was taking place on another planet. They have so much more control now. I'm speaking about the, the Israelis and the, and the lobby, the Jewish lobbies in France, in England, um, particularly. And of course, the Germans are afraid to say anything. That, uh, and in Italy as well, that you have the Europeans spending their money, their taxpayers' money, in, in sending troops to, uh, to bail out Israel in southern Lebanon. It's extraordinary that they get away with this. Uh, Jeffrey, who do you think uh, stands a better chance of being president uh, in the next election? Here? Yeah. Well, there's not going to be a peace candidate that, any, that has any kind of a chance. Uh, Barack Obama is, in fact, it was on record of wanting to bomb Iran, which I have not seen repeated in the newspapers. Uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, is all for war. And Obama is up for sale. Uh, he's actually could end up being the candidate, but there are, uh, the Dem people want to have a Democratic candidate they can like. And Obama is is like all things to all people. It, it turns out if you're going to be a black politician in the United States, you have to be a kind of a modern version of an Uncle Tom. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we've seen uh, in, in, with the Republican Party. We had Colin Powell being a, being a very faithful man to his, to his masters and Condoleezza Rice, and now Powell's making some criticisms. And Obama would be just the same. The, the, uh, the telling moment was when Senator Russell Feingold, who is the most anti-war senator against the, uh, against the war in Iraq, decided he would not run for president in 2008, and that meant... Uh, that he realized he was not going to get the funding. Now, Kucinich has announced he was going to run, uh, but he's an insignificant uh, politician. He's a member of Congress who get no money. So what we're yeah, going to have... Un is, unfortunately, he's a good man. He's a good man, but that's why he'll get no money. Uh, the Democratic Party is run by the, is funded by the Zionists, and they uh, determine what the politics are going to be. This is why you have this extraordinary situation where the head of the Democratic congressional campaign had only been in Congress two terms, but because he was Ram Emanuel, an Israeli-American, he was the one who decided where the money was going to go and who was going to run and be supported by the party for Congress. And in the Senate, you had Charles Schumer. And now Emanuel is the head of something called the Democratic Caucus. And some other congressperson who is a big supporter of Israel just got some other job. I mean, it's... It's, it is so extraordinary that when someone like Chomsky or people like Stephen Zunas and people who are purportedly support the Palestinian cause pretend this is insignificant, uh, they in fact uh, the Zionists could ask for no more better cooperation than what they get from from, the, from these pundits on the so-called left. Okay, so I guess we don't know who's going to be the star uh, on either. Uh in either party yet. It, 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 it's liable to be... Uh, um, McCain is scary. Uh, McCain is what? Uh, he's about, what, 80-some years old? No, no, no. McC McCain is probably, is probably in his late 60s. Uh, he was in Vietnam, which is um, 30 years ago, so he's probably, he's probably early 60s, 64 maybe. I think... Oh, and and no. Giuliani, Giuliani may run. They may run as a ticket. I hope not. Um, but uh, if you have Hillary Clinton or Obama, um, the, the choice the choices are, are, are horrendous. We don't really if have someone a like choice. Al Gore. Al Gore was 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 so beholden to the lobby when he was a, in, in, a senator and the vice president that uh, should he run, uh, he might get a lot of support. Uh, but <laughs> this seems, guy, the, the, the like, lobby, just, which is, it, it yeah. seems like we're running out of leaders in this country. Uh, we ran out a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, really, we're, we're in, we don't make them anymore. We're we're in deep trouble. I mean, here the people the people vote against the war, and the Democratic Party leaders we say make them in China. Huh? I said we, you know, we used to make good things here. Now we make them in China. That's maybe right. We need, maybe we need to call China to make us a couple of good uh, politicians. Well, the problem is, is people here who are decent and honest won't get into the game because you, it costs so 
much money to run for office, you have to sell yourself. It costs billions and millions of dollars to run for Congress. And if a contested election, you're talking about five, six, seven, eight million dollars. You have to get it from somewhere. And, and people who contribute money in, in large amounts are not altruists. They're, they're, they are looking for quid pro quo. As a matter of fact, and, it's interesting. Uh, Jeffrey. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're completely running out of time, oh, I but I that. guess we don't have a free country. We don't live in a free country anymore. We're just going to leave it at that. Thank you, sir, for uh, being on the program as we are completely out of time right now. Well, keep the faith. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Okay, Bye -bye. ladies and gentlemen, we will see you next Thursday. Now, next Thursday is still going to be in, uh, on Thursdays. Uh, on Thursday, next Thursday, of course. But... Don't forget, in the new year, it's going to be on Tuesday at 6.30. See you then. A bientôt.